Our speaker today is Professor Ivo Białyński Birula. I think uh, the speaker, there's no need for a long introduction uh, to Professor, to the achievements and uh, and scientific history of uh, Professor Birula. He's a co-founder of our institute. Uh, he was nominated to the uh, and received the uh, so-called po so Polish Nobel Prize. And today he will talk about the fidelity of photons. Thank you. The purpose of this talk is twofold. First, I want to make some announcements, which are usually the main subject, but I also wanted to teach you something about photons because photons are very interesting objects. Now about fidelity. This is a talk based on our paper published last year. And one of the messages I want to convey is that photons are not qubits. On many occasions, one treats photons as if they were qubits. That is, one is restricting their degrees of freedom to the states of polarization. Well, sometimes it may work, sometimes it doesn't. Now, a little curiosity. When I introduce fidelity of photons into Google today, our paper was the first from 2,440,000 results. How this can happen, I have no idea. I consulted my daughter who worked in Google for two years before she moved to Facebook. And she says, this is a top secret now because if somebody knew the algorithm, they can control it. And then one can put somebody's name or the name of the company in the first place. So this is why I have no idea why out of 2,440,000 results, our paper appeared as the first one. Okay, so now let me continue. This is also an interesting page because this paper got some interest in China. And this is a page from some Chinese website which says something in Chinese, I don't know what. Okay, so fidelity is a very fashionable term. One can search for fidelity. Of course, if you just write fidelity, then you get mostly the web pages of one of the biggest security companies, investment companies in the United States, which is called Fidelity. But if you are more careful, then you look in the abstracts of the physical review journals and in these journals, fidelity turned 3,300 results. So one would expect that this often used concept has always a well-defined meaning. But for photons, to which this term is very often applied, we have not found a precise good definition of fidelity. Why is it so? Well, there is a statement which defines the fidelity, fidelity very well. And this is taken from the book by Bengtsson and Zyczkowski on page 141. Thank you. One has a definition of fidelity. And in words, it says fidelity of two quantum states is the cosine squared of the distance calculated according to the Fubini study metric in the Hilbert space. Well, this sounds very, very precise. However, when we look closer at it, it's not so simple because to apply this definition, one needs the Hilbert space. So what is the Hilbert space of photon states? Well, one often takes a shortcut and defines the states in the first level of Fox space. And the state then is created by the creation operator and the creation operator are labeled by some modes of the electromagnetic field. Well, this may be sometimes sufficient, sometimes it is not. 
in the general case, if we want really to treat photons seriously, we need the Hilbert space, a genuine Hilbert space for photon states. So the best place to look for it is in the paper written by Wigner in 1939. We have written a popular introduction to this concept in postempive physics, but I will now talk about it in some more detail. The first observation is that Photons are not just modes of the electromagnetic field, but they are real elementary particles. And this table even shows that they are exceptionally interesting because photon has connections with many, many other particles. There are only two other particles that have two connections, as you can see here. Namely, Higgs has two connections. I'm sorry, has also three connections, but other particles have, have at most two connections. So photon is a genuine elementary particle and it should be really treated like this. Something is not working too well because when I want to find next page, then I cannot do it sometimes. And Maybe arrows page. on the keyboard are not working. Arrows on the keyboard. Yes, they are. Thank you very much. So the Hilbert space of photons consists of functions f plus minus of the wave vector k. The index plus minus refers to photon helicity. That is the circular polarization. And hk, of course, is the momentum. Pure states of photons are described by table of two such functions because we need a general case of polarization. So you see already from here that the classification of polarizations as is most often done into horizontal and vertical may have something to do with us on the earth, but it is not very profound, the profound classification is into helicity states. Why? Because helicity states transform separately. They are just differing by the phase. This is the transformation. I will not write a formula for the big data. That can be inferred from Wigner's paper. There is a relativistically invariant scalar product why this is relativistic invariant? Because obviously the modulus of F uh, does not depend on theta. And second, the corrected volume element D3K over K is relativistically invariant. So it would seem that we have settled the problems. However, some problems still remain, namely, all experiments are conducted in space and in time. And photons live in real space and not in some mathematically constructed momentum space. So how can we define fidelity in space? In non-relativistic quantum mechanics, this problem is quite simple because we have the Plancherel theorem. And the Plancherel theorem proclaims that the norms in position state and the momentum space space are the same. So by the well-known polarization identity, we can define the scalar product once we know the norm. And in non-relativistic quantum mechanics, the problem is solved. We have fidelities which can be evaluated in position space or in Fourier space, and they are equal. But non-relativistic quantum mechanics does not work for photons, obviously, because they are non-relativistic as much as they could be. So now we have the problem, how to connect the Hilbert space in momentum space, the, with the scalar product defined by Wigner and the wave functions in position space. Well, the first 
idea is just to take the Fourier transform. So I take f of k of Wigner and I Fourier transform it. This is wrong. This would work in non-relativistic physics, but this does not work because it was already shown by Pauli many, many years ago that this object with the tilde here is non-local. What does it mean that it's non-local? That means that when we transport this by making a simple transformation, even a rotation, simple rotation, then the value of this function here of R does not depend exclusively on the value of this function in the previous point before rotation, but it depends on all points in space. So this is clearly a non-local object and does not work. Physics, especially relativistic physics, must be local. So the solution of this is suggested by the classical theory of electromagnetism. Unfortunately, photons are elements that provide a good link between classical and quantum physics. And we know that electric and magnetic field vectors have perfect local transformation properties. They transform as components of a tensor, anti-symmetric tensor. There's no problem with that. So let's try to use this hint to construct a photon wave function, which would be local. And here is the definition. This, and I will say more about this definition on the next slide. So this is the definition. And here we have vector E plus or minus of K. What is this? This is the classical polarization vector as appearing in classical theory of electromagnetism, which describes left-handed and right-handed circularly polarized waves. And the normalization factor here in front will be explained later. So we have a candidate for the photon wave function. I will say a bit more about this because it is an object that in a way was already known to Polish physicist Ludwig Zilberstein and perhaps even to Riemann, but that's not clear because there's nothing in the works of Riemann, but the person who announced this vector in posthumously published lecture notes has this construction. This is a combination, a complex combination of the electric field and the magnetic field. I put these factors here, epsilon and mu, just to make the dimensions equal. And this is the equation that this vector satisfies, which is equivalent to Maxwell equations. And there is an interesting analogy here. This cross product, the curl of F, can be also written in terms of the spin matrices for spin one particles. And photons are spin one particles. So we have perfect analogy with the Weyl equation for neutrinos, for massless spin one half particles. The only difference between this equation and the Weyl equation is that the vector S, which refers to spin one matrices, must be replaced by Pauli matrices sigma, which refer to spin one half particles. So this makes our even more sure that this is the right, right way to proceed. And indeed, we'll proceed. But moreover, there is a constraint. There are no constraints, nothing like that. Forget what, about potentials, about everything. There are no constraints here. I'm not talking a lot about Lagrangian formalism. I'm talking about Maxwell equation. And yes, Maxwell no, equation. but the, the divergence of D and yeah, B. Yeah, but this is automatically true because when you take divergence of the equation, then the right-hand side is zero because it's a curl. Uh, yeah, but the, uh, I, I mean, uh, this constraint is conserved simply. But there is a constraint in initial value. Yeah, but, but I agree. But the problem of constraints does not arrive here. Yeah, of, of course, because, because it's I separate. Have, 
yeah. I have an arbitrary function of k, two functions, f plus and minus, there are no constraints on these functions. And now I construct something from these functions. Ah, okay, okay. And this is now a confirmation that this is the right approach. If one transforms f in this formula, according to Wigner, then one gets the transformation properties of the electromagnetic field as given by the vectors D and B, which are parts of the electromagnetic field. So this makes sense. Now the problem is, what about fidelity? After all, the fidelity is our problem. And there is one more information which as an old teacher I want to convey is what is the role played by these E vectors, by these polarization vectors. They seem to be something trivial, but they're not. They have a very profound meaning. Namely, as you see from this formula here, they convert one scalar function into a vector because vectors have three components and these functions both have one component. Therefore, this is a fairly involved transformation. And this is the common property of all solutions of relativistic equations, because in momentum space, they have, so to speak, fewer degrees of freedom. For example, in the Dirac equation, we have two functions and the Dirac spinner has four components. So always have this mismatch between the number of components in momentum space and these scaffolds solve the problem. And now we come back to HC factor, namely F modulo squared is the same as the energy density. Therefore, if one wants to have the correct here, not only the value, but also the dimension of f, one should introduce this factor, but that does not play any significant role. Now back to our problem of fidelity. Once we have wave function in position space, we can apply it to this function, obvious rules. We construct the Hilbert space with the scalar product, which is the obvious scalar product defined as the, as the scalar product of these two vectors, one of them Hermitian conjugate. So we have a definition of the scalar products. Once we have the definition of the scalar product, we can define fidelity. So now we have two fidelities. One fidelity, which comes from Hilbert space in momentum space. One fidelity, which comes from position space. For non-relativistic particles, as I mentioned before, these fidelities are equal and that's it. For photons, they are not equal. They're related in a rather complicated way. So to illustrate this, I did the following calculation. I calculated the scalar product in terms of F functions. And then I translated this because there's a relation between F and Psi given before in terms of Psi. And the right-hand side is rather peculiar because it is non-local. So there is some deep problem here with locality, namely momentum space fidelity implies non-locality in position space. Still, we can calculate both fidelities and compare them. One way to compare this, and it also illustrates the concept of non-locality, is to take the same state, then I shift the state in space by A, in some direction doesn't matter. And now I have two wave functions, one that I started from and the other, which is the shifted wave function and I calculate the fidelity. Very simple scalar product can be evaluated and I get two curves. These curves illustrate different behavior of these two fidelities 
as a function of the distance between these two states. One can here see that momentum, the upper curve, is more non-local. That is when I move these wave functions away from each other, the fidelity increases much slower than for the position fidelity. The position fidelity drops down quickly, more quickly than the previous one. So there is a difference and it should be kept in mind that these fidelities are not equal and they have something to do with locality. Now we have a third measure of fidelity now, which turns out to be quite interesting. And this is based on the coherent states of the electromagnetic field. Well, coherent states are constructed with the help of the creation operator, as was done in great detail by Roy Glauber. A dagger creates the photon in the state described by the normalized wave function F. Very clear, well-defined definition of a general creation operator. Now we use this operator to create the coherent state. And I use the Glauber displacement operator. This is a unitary operator that as Glauber explained, displaces the vacuum state to a different place in, in this configuration space of coherent state. So we have a definition of coherent state, well-defined. It also depends on the mean number of photons. In coherent state, the number of photons obeys the Poisson distribution, but there is the mean here that controls the, the, this Poisson distribution, and this is the average mean number of photons. Now, once we have coherent states, we can introduce Hilbert space of coherent states. And this is not the same as the Hilbert space of one photon state. The scalar product can be calculated according to well-known rules that are obeyed by vectors in Fox space. And this is the result. It's a good exercise for people who understand bosons because for, photo, for fermions, this is completely different. There are no coherent states of photons. So this is the result. The result has mean number of photons in both these states, and also the scalar product of the one photon wave function, but in the exponent now. And this has some interesting consequences. So let's see what are the consequences. Once we have scalar product, we can calculate fidelity. The states are normalized, so there's no need to introduce denominators. And this is what happens here. Fidelity of coherent states for the same wave functions, one photon wave functions, as we would use to define fidelity according to Wigner. Indeed, this for coherent state depends on the fidelity for photons, but not only on the fidelity of photons and the mean numbers, but also there is this cosine phi, which appeared here, and there is no way of getting rid of it. And this is a surprising element, because as we teach students of quantum mechanics, we always say overall phase has no physical meaning. The overall phase of the wave function of the photon, therefore, which here appears as phi, should have no physical meaning. And indeed, for single photon, it does not have any measurable effect. However, when we use these different wave functions, even though the photon state is the same, in other words, the Hilbert space of these coherent states is characterized by the states of photons, and the state of photons is not any different if I change the phase of the state. However, here we see the appearance of the classical phase. We always wonder what is the 
relation between classical electromagnetic field and the quantum electromagnetic field. And here there's some illustration of this relation, namely what I do here is the following first. We can calculate now the fidelity as a function of phi for the same states, but photon states, but with different mean number of photons. And you see that the dependence on this phase for one photon mean value, so the mean value equal one is much broader. That is the phase makes more difference. However, when we increase the number of mean number of photons, this becomes more and more classical. That is, does not depend on the phase. It drops down to, to zero, this. And now, uh, what is the mean, physical meaning of this phase? This meaning is simply the so-called duality angle. So we start with the average value of the quantized electromagnetic field in the coherent state F. And we get riemann silberstein vector multiplied by the phase. The phase characterizes the coherent state. And what is the meaning of this formula? When we resolve this in terms of electric and magnetic field vectors, we have what is called dual rotation, electric and magnetic field in the plane made of electricity and magnetism are rotated by the angle phi. So this gives some classical meaning to the phase and connects the classical characteristic of the field. So now it's time for the summary. And I hope there will be some discussion. So the description of photons as merely the carriers of polarization is not right. It ignores a lot of properties and we surely could do better than that. And there's much more to the photon that meets the eye and one may even quote one of the sentences that belong to Einstein that something like it, it's only a rascal that can claim that he understands what photons are. So maybe we are approaching this understanding, but at a very slow pace. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So now we have time for questions. Who is Torbs? Yeah, so, so maybe, can I start? Yes. So. In general, by fidelity, we mean some measure which is operationally related with how is it uh, likely that we confuse two states with each other. So, so, so this fidelity will, will have this operational meaning of distinguishing the states. So for example, it will appear in some protocols where we try to find the minimum probability of telling the, the, how the state changes and so on and so on. So I was wondering, uh, since you introduced many fidelities, which one would be closest to this operational uh, meaning of this? This is the this is the question to you, Panyarafale. You should answer. You know these protocols. The name sounds more like police, but still, you should think about it. How is it really? happening in the real life. What yeah, because, I can... because what, what I would suspect is that, for example, depending on the character of measurement, whether it's uh, spatial measurement or momentum measurement, we would use probably different, different quantity. Good, very good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, my other remark, my was going in the same direction as Rafa, but he was first, so he will have to work more now. Because um, for me also fidelity in some sense could be interpreted as a probability. If we put absolute value square, it has the same uh, meaning, physical meaning as probability. So naturally there is a question, which is a probability of what? If you have two photons, how you can find a physical, a scheme of physical experiment in which this fidelity enters as a kind of probability. 
I, have I, no I may only comment at that point that taking uh, the concepts of uh, non-relativistic quantum mechanics, his, Hilbert spaces, uh, probability with its all canonical properties like positive definition into relativistic physics is dangerous. Yes, 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 sure. I mean, relativistic approach, uh, not always uh, admits this uh, simple structure of non-relativistic quantum mechanics, which we all have in mind without certain modifications. And uh, basically here we see that photons are everywhere uh, in around us, but they are in intrinsically relativistic objects. And their relativistic nature cannot be easily neglected, right? And this is, I think, what is behind this, this difficulty. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And what did I say in my defense? Uh, the Hilbert spaces which I introduced are well defined. And of course, there is no way of telling which is better from the physical point of view. However, now it's up to people who apply notion of fidelity to real experiments to test these mathematical definitions and see which one of them suits them better. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Maybe I can I can ask one once more. Uh, so is this uh, relation between fidelities that this momentum fidelity is always larger than position? It's rigorous in general, yes? It's, uh, or it's just an example? I, I, no, I have no theorem. OK. But I, I believe that this is true, yes. Yeah, because it's some because kind of, of con convolution, yes? It's... Because of the non-locality in position space, which certainly extends somehow the, the connection between these states. If you take states, what does it mean that they are uh, different? That means that they're, uh, when, when they are different in momentum space, of course, that means that the wave function in momentum space has, has a somewhat different uh, shape. And now this shape is diffused in position space. And this is what makes them in a way, in position space, photons feel points which are further away. So I, I was wondering if it could be phrased in the spirit of uh, that we, we know that if we, for example, uh, have a pure state and uh, make a mixture of it, fidelity can only increase. Yes, if we have some channel that that makes a mixed state out of pure state. So somehow this convolution may be would be viewed as a kind of smearing of position. So like making kind of a mixed state out of pure, I don't know, okay, it's not the same, but. Oh, you mentioned one thing which I have not studied. That is how would this work for mixed states? That's an interesting question. Maybe to Karol Zyczkowski also how to extend this to mixed states. Yes. Which are now studied very well in the ordinary setup. I have a question concerning this dual rotation. Um, this is really such a simple symmetry of, of electrodynamics only in the absence of sources. True, true. Uh, if, we have, if we know that we have only electric charges, then it fixes the definition of D versus B. Mm -hmm. uh, does it have any uh, impact on what you have said about these fidelities for the coherent states? Know, because this is all for pure photons with free space, Maxwell equations without sources. This is a very interesting problem, how this symmetry, dual symmetry is broken. This yeah. is something, and for example, a question that bothers me for many years is, is this breaking the same in all parts of the universe? <laughs> that is, it has electricity, have the same meaning in distant galaxies. Because at least around us, it has a very well-defined ah, yeah, sure. meaning. This is like a problem with the 
with the electric plugs. They are different in different parts of the <laughs> different countries. <laughs> so not only we had to carry different plugs, but also different <laughs> engines. <laughs> it's slightly deeper. <laughs> But concerning this ambiguity, uh, at what limits uh, this ambiguity should disappear? If I have strong pulses, uh, as in uh, the last part of this talk, we see it that- It does disappear when we take the definition in terms of coherent states and put many, many, many photons into this coherent state, then, then it becomes more and more classical. And, and then- uh, Concerning to previous definitions, yeah, and this point, then it coincides with the definition in momentum space mm -hmm. rather than in position space. And then concerning frequency of pulses, I would expect that if I have uh, well high frequency pulse, then because fidelity in coherent states is really fidelity for electromagnetic fields. Or something like that, closer to fidelity of magnetic and electric fields. Mm -hmm. well, I, I suspect that if we if we take uh, cavity electrodynamics and consider photon set as excitations in a cavity mm -hmm. uh, that is uh, especially spatially limited uh, uh, somehow object, then it will again be something else because uh, you perform quantization in empty space, right? Where uh, right. plane waves momentum mm -hmm. representation is natural. Yes. But, and therefore there is this asymmetry between position and momentum space in a certain way. But now mm -hmm. if you turn the thing around and consider the ca a cavity. In a cavity, you also have a connection between position and some quantum numbers that and yes, momentum. Uh, but then this fidelity, this asymmetry would look different, what I'm saying, right? Yes, good, good point. Uh, I, I wondered so one more thing. So you mentioned in the end about this global phase, which is not relevant, or then it is relevant in the end. Uh, but of course, in your example, this phase was relevant because you had like a scalar product between two modes. Yes, I mean, you had somehow coherent states built uh, on two different wave functions. And that's why this was basically this relative phase between these modes, this, which is physical. Yes, yeah, true. But, but the puzzle is why even though photons are the same, the states of photons are the same, we still see this in the fidelity defined in terms of coherent states. I, I explained this as a way of introducing the classical phase into the quantum world. Because, because the phase of the electromagnetic field, this duality phase is a classical concept. And, and it is related to the quantum mechanical wave function of the photon in a very simple way. It's the same phase as the wave phase of the wave function, overall phase of the wave function. Um, I have a technical question around this global phase somehow. Uh, I mean, it's, it's related. So you showed that those different descriptions of the well, different wave functions of photons give different fidelities, but okay, in quantum information or in those like in the geometrical study of uh, quantum information, there are those higher order fidelities, namely Bergman invariance, when you take uh, not just fidelity between two states, but you take triple, like three states or more, and then you somehow have a relational information between them, uh, like how they are sort of located in space. So uh, did, you, did you play with, with that? Maybe like, uh, is, it, is this also distorted as fidelity? I have as no you... idea. I am a very simple person. I just use fidelity in the simplest possible case 
uh, if there are any ways of extend this, uh, everybody is welcome to do this. I'm sure it can be done because the formalism is there. Michal, yeah, but relativistic physics will spoil this simple picture. Very good. I suspect. Because relativistic physics is the true physics. And sometimes non-relativistic approximations do not work. It's actually a very strange result. Yeah, so, well, but this duality phase is purely classical, but it's unphysical. How can we perform experiment <laughs> with the with this object phi in electro classical electromagnetic electrodynamics? Of course, we distinguish uh, in real life. We distinguish electric vectors from magnetic vectors. Yes, but how do we? change that distinction in a real world? How do we produce a machine, equipment, experiment, which generates different files? Well, the duality happens in real experiments when you have circularly polarized waves, when the electric vector and magnetic vectors mm -hmm. rotate and they exchange their position. So this is the simplest example of dual rotation. Not really, because in order to produce this wave, we have the sources. Yes, the but once this wave, that, that, that's a good point. Once this wave is produced, it forgets about sources. And that is the problem I had when I tried to see whether we can, watching the galaxy, the light from galaxies, I can tell whether they are electric in the same sense that we are electric on Earth. And of course, the problem is that once light is emitted, it loses information about whether it was an electric dipole or a magnetic dipole that produced this radiation. But the loss of information isn't somehow related to the fidelity? Uh, I don't see a connection, but maybe there is. Can I also comment uh, about this? So. It seems that uh, uh, because we have those wave functions in the position representation and in the uh, momentum representation and the transformation which joins them uh, is non-unitary because the inner products between states yes. do not agree. Uh, and then if someone thinks in terms of like uh, the normal quantum mechanics, it seems that the photon has uh, completely different description when we look at it uh, and behaves differently when we look at it in the uh, in the position representation and in the momentum representation. Absolutely is, true, yes. Fidelity is one yeah, example. So this is uh, something uh, which is, uh, I don't know, uh, it's very weird from the point of view of normal quantum mechanics. <laughs> Good. If yeah. you that means yeah, but is I, there anything like normal relativistic quantum mechanics? I no, no. I, I was referring to uh, normal non-relativistic mechanics, where it doesn't matter in which uh, uh, representation we look at the uh, at the states of of particles. So maybe I can add some some comment because for me the best intuitive physical explanation is to realize that. Like photon is pure energy, yes? I mean, there is no rest mass. And, and that's why you always have energy which is dependent on frequency, yes? And, and uh, so, so you don't have rest mass. So speaking about spatial probability of detecting something is like uh, impact. There is an impact of this fact that you have energy proportional to frequency which enters in Fourier transform as well. So, so like you cannot decouple the, the mass from, from this uh, Fourier transform aspect, yes? And uh, that's my intuition why, why this, is this, this problem appears, yes? Well, I add one more here explanation. For relativistic Dirac particles, two scalar products are the same in position space and in momentum space, which is probably an illustration of how masslessness here is important. 